Hello, my name is Doug Jensen. If you've owned a professional Sony video camera during the last 16 years, then maybe you've seen one of my dozens of masterclass training videos or read one of the field guide books that I've written to help colleagues such as yourself get the best performance from their camera. I'm happy to announce that I've just completed a seven hour in-depth masterclass for the newest camera in Sony's cinema line, the FX6. The FX6 is a great little camera that packs more features, performance, and image quality into its compact body than any other camera that came before it, and all at a fraction of the price of cameras that offer similar specifications. Now, if you're interested in the FX6, chances are that you've already seen some of the countless videos done by YouTube reviewers and influencers who have millions of followers. But that's not what this video is about. I'm not here to convince you to buy an FX6 or tell you how great it is or how it compares to any other cameras, or to dazzle you with shots of ballerinas doing pirouettes and skateboarders catching some air in slow motion. That's all great stuff, but none of that tells you how to use the FX6, and that's where this masterclass comes in. I own this FX6. It is not a demo or a loaner from Sony that I got yesterday and will have to ship back tomorrow. I actually bought my camera from B&H at full retail price and I've been shooting with it and preparing this masterclass for nearly two months now. As with all of my masterclass videos, my goal is to help you flatten the learning curve and maximize the performance of your new camera. I know what you need to know and what features and functions of the FX6 are most important because I have nearly 40 years of experience working as a cameraman in the television high-end video production industries, with credits that include 60 Minutes, The Olympics, Survivor, Eco Challenge, 2020, Nat Geo, Discovery, countless documentaries, reality shows, news programs, and literally hundreds of corporate productions. I've spent weeks thoroughly testing the FX6 with charts and scopes in the studio and out in the field with real world shooting situations. I've determined what I think are the best practices, settings, and methods of shooting with the camera. And the hardest part of all, I've distilled my findings down into 26 chapters organized by topic so that I can share my findings with you. In other words, I've done the time consuming work of testing, analyzing, and trial and error experimentation so you don't have to. Now, if that all sounds good to you, then let's get started. Now, even though I just got done saying this isn't a promotional video for the camera, I do want to spend a couple of minutes listing what I think are the highlights of the FX6 and what makes it so special. First of all, the FX6 is best described as a baby version of Sony's flagship cinema cameras, the Venice and FX9. It shares a lot of their DNA and in some ways even exceeds their capabilities. It has a full frame 10.2 megapixel 4K sensor for excellent shallow depth of field, more than 15 stops of dynamic range, and almost zero rolling shutter. Autofocus is amazing, especially when shooting people. It has Sony's patented electronic variable neutral density filter that makes setting exposure about as simple as turning the dimmer on an LED light. Once you've used variable ND, it's going to be very difficult to go back to any camera that doesn't have it. It's compatible with more than 50 native E-mount lenses, and with the right adapter, pretty much every full-frame lens in the world can be used on the FX6, including those from Canon, Nikon, and PL Cinema lenses. It can record 4K slow motion at 120 frames per second, or HD at 240 frames per second for as long as you want, with no special processing required, and with full 10-bit 422 quality. It's got a timecode jack for frame accurate synchronization with other cameras on a multi-camera shoot. It's got a 12G SDI port and a full-size HDMI jack that can both be used simultaneously. It can record four channels of high quality 24-bit 48 kilohertz audio and has five potential ways of getting audio into the camera. It gives you the option of shooting with S-Log, HLG, or Sony's new S Cinetone mode that provides natural skin tones and a cinematic look with gentle highlight roll off for productions that won't have additional color grading in post. Depending on the needs of your production, it gives you a choice of recording with Sony's excellent and efficient 10 bit 422XAVC-I codex or 8 bit 420XAVC-L codex. It's equipped with two card slots that can record on CF Express Type A cards or fast SDXC cards. They can record 4K to both cards simultaneously, plus it allows you to capture low resolution proxy files at the same time if you want them. It's excellent in low light with two ISO sensitivity modes. I'd say it's definitely the most noise-free camcorder in low light that I have ever used. 
And finally, it has all the external buttons, knobs, and switches that you'd expect to find on any professional Sony camcorder, thus saving you the hassle of diving into the menus every time you need to change a setting. Speaking of external controls, at this point during one of my masterclass videos, I like to lay the groundwork for all the rest of the chapters by taking a quick tour around the camera to help you get familiar with the layout, and then we'll come back to them in later chapters for more detail. So let's get started because, as I like to say, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Now, I think the best place to begin is by addressing the elephant in the room, and that elephant is a surprising and very disappointing decision by Sony not to include a viewfinder with the FX6. Yes, the camera has a fairly decent 3.5 inch LCD panel, but this is a monitor. It is not a viewfinder, and I refuse to call it a viewfinder. By definition, an electronic viewfinder, also known as an EVF, must have a glass eyepiece with an adjustable diopter or loop that you look through. Unlike an LCD panel, a true viewfinder blocks out ambient light and allows you to have a very close-up, detailed, bright view of the picture, which is essential for accurate manual focusing, exposure adjustments, and for keeping tabs on all the other camera settings that are superimposed over the picture. In addition to enabling you to see the picture better, an often overlooked advantage of an electronic viewfinder is that it also gives you an additional point of contact during handheld shooting, which makes it so much easier to keep the camera rock steady. The old FS5 has an LCD monitor and a viewfinder. My Z280 has both. And the FX9 has an excellent loop that flips down over the LCD panel to turn it into a viewfinder, just like the FS7 that came before it. Even the little A7S III has an OLED viewfinder, but on the FX6, all we get is an LCD monitor. Now granted, everyone has their own shooting style and methods of operating a camera, so perhaps a lack of a viewfinder doesn't bother you as much as it bothers me. But in my opinion, this is by far the weakest aspect of the FX6. Personally, I cannot shoot with a camera that doesn't have a proper viewfinder. Fortunately, Zacuto, a company with a great reputation for making high-end camera accessories and whose products I've been using for years, has three excellent solutions that solve the lack of a viewfinder problem perfectly. We'll take a look at Zacuto's viewfinder options later in this chapter, and I'll tell you what I've ultimately decided to use on my FX6. And we'll talk about the reasons you might choose one solution over another. But for now, I'm going to leave the FX6 in the default configuration. Now let's talk about the LCD panel for a minute because although it's not a viewfinder, it is an important component of the camera. Its 1280 by 720 resolution does provide decent image quality and as far as I can tell, it's the same panel that is found on the FX9 and it certainly has higher resolution than the old FS5's LCD screen. The monitor comes with a handy sunshade that is not only collapsible but it's also detachable for times when you don't want it on board the camera at all and it takes just a few seconds to move the monitor and no tools are required. The monitor's cable is long enough that you can easily position in different places around the camera. In fact, there are multiple quarter 20 threaded sockets spread out around the handle and camera body for attaching lights, external monitors, microphone receivers, or any other accessories you may desire. And maybe one reason Sony thinks you don't want a loop covering the LCD panel is because the monitor is actually a touchscreen. So they figure, well, how could you use the touchscreen if there was a loop over it? Well, personally, I have no interest in putting my greasy fingers all over a monitor that is also supposed to double as the primary way I see what I'm shooting. So I'm not about to use the touchscreen feature, but that's a call you'll need to make for yourself. Just be aware that there's nothing you can do with the touchscreen that can't also be done with the camera's other buttons, knobs, switches, and joysticks. So how you choose to interact with the camera is completely up to you. And regardless of what I think about the touchscreen, it's always good to have options, right? Along the left side of the monitor, you'll find buttons for peaking and zebra. Peaking is an important focus assist tool that adds edge enhancement to objects within the picture to make it easier to focus a lens manually. We'll talk more about peaking in chapter 14. Likewise, Zebra is a critical exposure assist tool that we'll talk about in chapter 12. If you want to get great results with the FX6, it's imperative that you master the use of both peaking and Zebra. The third button on the monitor, as you can see by the label on it, is known as assign button number 9, which by default will cycle through the camera's three different video signal monitor modes when pressed repeatedly. The modes are waveform, vector scope, histogram, and then off again. We'll cover the video signal monitor in later chapters, but for now, let's talk about assign buttons. 
As you'll see as we continue our tour around the camera, the FX6 has nine assigned buttons scattered around various locations on the camera body, the handle, and the grip. Each one of them can be customized to instantly activate any one of 54 different functions that you get to choose. That way you can easily turn your most frequently used settings on or off at the touch of a button without having to scroll through layers of menus. Now some of the functions that can be given to an assigned button include such things as base ISO sensitivity, autofocus face detection, and one touch playback of the last clip you shot. We'll talk about all the assigned button options and how to program them in chapter 11. Underneath the LCD monitor, you'll find a mirror switch that can be used to flip the picture vertically and or horizontally. With so many different ways to mount the LCD on the camera and rotate its orientation, this is a very nice feature to have. So let's talk about lenses for a minute. As you probably know, the FX6 can be purchased as a body-only model or as a bundled package that includes this Sony 24-105mm f4 full-frame lens. This lens features steady shot, a constant f4 aperture, autofocus, auto iris, and decent image quality for the price. Now you may or may not have decided to buy this lens with your camera, but since it's the official kit lens, I'm going to assume that you have one because many of the functions and settings that we'll be talking about will work differently or won't be available at all if you're using a different lens. A big advantage of Sony's E-mount is that it has a very short flange focal depth, and that makes it easier for you to use almost any SLR or cinema lens that you can lay your hands on, provided you've got the right adapter. And since most adapters merely serve as a mechanical dock and don't have any glass in them, they won't cause any loss of light or diminished optical performance. There are many things that make the FX6 an amazing camera, but quite literally, one of the biggest is the full frame sensor. It's generally assumed, although I don't think Sony has said so officially, that the FX6 has the same 10.2 megapixel sensor as Sony's A7S III mirrorless camera. But of course, with the FX6, you get all the bells and whistles of a true cinema camcorder. Right now, there are only two other full-frame cinema cameras in Sony's entire product line, the FX9 and the Venice. All other Sony 4K cinema cameras, such as the F55, FS7, and FS5, only have Super 35mm sensors. Now, it seems ironic to hear myself say that those other cameras only have Super 35 sensors because just a few years ago, Super 35 seemed enormous compared to the sensors that most professional video cameras had been using. But technology marches on, and today, Super 35 is yesterday's news, and now full-frame sensors are all the rage. Compared to a 4K Super 35 sensor, the FX6's 4K full-frame sensor has more than twice the surface area. And the biggest advantage of that larger surface area is that it can help you achieve shallower depth of field in your shots, thus giving you a range of creative options that can't be matched with cameras that have smaller sensors. The second advantage of the FX6's full-frame sensor is how well it performs on low light. The FX6 is certainly the best low light camcorder that I've ever used, even better than the FX9 or Venice, even though all three have full frame sensors. The FX6 is better in low light because it has a 4.2K sensor, while the Venice and FX9 have a 6K sensor. Having 30% fewer pixels in the same physical space means that the individual pixels of the FX6 can be bigger, and all things being equal, bigger pixels can collect more light. However, the higher resolution 6K sensor of the FX9 in Venice does have a major advantage over the FX6, and that is the ability to shoot 4K with a crop Super 35 shooting mode. Yes, the FX6 does have a Super 35 mode, but you can only use it when you're shooting with an HD recording format. Now we'll talk more about recording formats in chapter five, but the thing I want you to understand right now is that the FX6 can only shoot 4K in the full frame mode and the full frame mode requires the use of full frame lenses. So that rules out the use of most PL lenses and all APS-C lenses when you're shooting with one of the 4K recording formats. Getting back to the camera itself, the grip on the FX6 is basically the same one that is used on the FS5. The grip feels comfortable in your hand and the record button falls right where it should. And since there's no extension arm jutting out to get in the way, the FX6 is much easier to carry in a small bag or backpack. If you need a camera that can come out of the bag and be powered up and ready to roll in less than three seconds, you can't beat the FX6. The grip can be detached completely from the camera by pressing the grip release button. It's kind of hard to see unless the grip has already been removed and then rotating the grip clockwise until it comes loose. 
When the grip and top panel are taken off, the Slim Down FX6 is perfect for use on gimbals, small steady cams, drones, or in compact underwater housings. Of course, you'll also lose all audio inputs when the handle is removed, but we'll save that topic for later. The grip is much more than just an accessory for holding the camera. It's actually an integral part of the camera's design and offers several other important functions that can make shooting easier. Let's take a closer look. First, we find one of the camera's two multi-selector joysticks. Its main purpose is for navigating through the menus and making changes. But we'll be talking a lot more about the other things you can do with the multi-selector as we proceed through the rest of this masterclass. Just above the multi-selector, you'll find a record button. This is probably the most important feature of the grip because it makes starting and stopping recording during handheld shooting so easy. Next, we find a button with a 5 printed on it. The number 5 tells that this is assigned button number 5, which, as the label above it says, is pre-programmed to activate the camera's direct menu mode. So that brings up the logical question, what the heck is the direct menu mode? Well, the easiest way to explain it is to demonstrate it. Watch what happens when I press assign button number 5. A white underlying cursor is displayed beneath all the different settings that can be quickly changed via the direct menu. If a setting is highlighted in orange, that indicates that that item is selected and ready to be changed. I can move over to a different setting by pushing the multi-selector joystick one way or another. For example, right now we see that gain is highlighted in orange. So if I want to change the gain, I press in on the center of the joystick and then click it to raise or lower the gain as needed. When I find the value I want to use, I can lock it in by pressing in on the center of the joystick. And a couple of seconds later, the camera will automatically exit the direct menu mode so I can return to normal shooting. So what settings can be changed via the direct menu? Well, technically, there are 18 settings that can be changed. But depending on the camera's current configuration and the type of lens that is being used, only some of those 18 settings will be available at any given time. These are the 16 settings that will typically be available to change during normal operation. The autofocus mode, steady shot, the white balance mode, the white balance color temperature, the scene file, the ND filter mode, the ND filter value, the iris mode, and if manual is selected, the actual iris value, the gain mode, and if manual is selected, the actual gain value, the shutter speed mode, and if manual is selected, the actual shutter value, the auto exposure mode, the auto exposure level, and finally, the S and Q motion frame rate. Now, the idea behind the direct menu is that it provides a quick way of changing settings during handheld shooting without taking your eyes off the monitor. But let me point out that many of the functions that can be changed with the direct menu also have dedicated controls elsewhere on the camera that are often actually easier to use than the direct menu. As you'll learn, there's almost always more than one way of turning a function on or off or adjusting its value. For example, I can think of at least seven different ways of changing the gain setting. So as you get more experience with the camera, you'll soon figure out which method or methods work best for you. On top of the grip, you'll find a zoom rocker switch for use with compatible zoom lenses. Unfortunately, even though the 24 to 105 kit lens is a zoom lens, it does not have any servo controls, and therefore it is not a compatible lens. But here's a cool thing about the FX6. Even when you don't have a compatible zoom lens mounted on the camera, this switch can still be used to activate the clear image zoom function, which is Sony's proprietary name for what is usually called digital zoom on other cameras. Clear image zoom magnifies the image up to two times when shooting in HD or 1.5x when shooting in 4K. And because it's digital, it can be activated with the zoom rocker switch even when you're not using a compatible zoom lens. Sony claims that the technology they developed makes clear image zoom superior to the ordinary digital zoom you often find on other cameras. So is it any good? Well, we'll put it to the test in chapter 24 and you can come to your own conclusions. Next to the zoom control, we find a sign button number four with the words focus mag stenciled next to it. So obviously, focus magnifier is this button's default function. But since it's an assigned button, you've got the option of reprogramming it for any of the other 54 allowed functions. Pressing this button once will electronically magnify the center of the image in the viewfinder by 300%, thus making it easier to check the focus. Pressing it a second time will magnify the image 600%. 
you can use the multi-selector's joystick to change which part of the screen is being magnified. Pressing in on the joystick will return the magnified box to the center, and pressing the assign button a third time will return the viewfinder to normal. Now, Focus Mag works with all lenses and all shooting modes, so you can even use Focus Magnification while you're recording because it's purely a monitoring function and doesn't affect the image that's being recorded internally or what's being output by either of the video connectors. Moving to the front of the grip, we find the assignable dial, which by default can be used to change the iris of a compatible lens. But as you may have guessed by its name, the assignable dial can be reprogrammed for a different function instead, one that might be more useful to you. We'll talk more about this dial in Chapter 11. The final control on the grip, hidden discreetly away on the inside, is assign button number 6. Notice that this assign button doesn't have a label next to it, and the reason for that is because it's the only one that doesn't have a default function. In Chapter 11, we'll give it one. The camera's main controls are logically laid out and should feel familiar to anyone who has used other Sony professional camcorders, especially the FS5, which is definitely the FX6's closest relative. Starting at the top left, we find the camera's primary record button. Unlike the FS5, this button actually lights up while the camera is recording, and that is a feature I really like. Next, the hold switch can be used to disable some of the buttons on the camera and grip thus preventing unintended changes from accidentally being made. But as I said, the hold switch only affects some of the camera's controls. For example, the hold switch does not lock the power switch, audio level dials, audio input switches, auto focus switch, gain switch, white balance switch, or the peaking and zebra buttons. If you've used an FS5 before, you may notice that the full auto button on that camera has been eliminated on the FX6. As a matter of fact, there is no full auto mode at all on the FX6, which in my opinion is an excellent decision by Sony. Anyone who thinks that they need to have a full auto mode on a camera as sophisticated as the FX6 really has no business shooting with a camera like this in the first place. Unfortunately, Sony has replaced the full auto button with something nearly as worthless to the average shooter. They call it the clip flag button. And I predict that there is only about a 2% chance that you will ever use this button. And to make matters worse, it is not an assign button, so you cannot program this very conveniently located button for any other function. When you press the clip flag button during recording or just after recording has ended, an invisible marker will be inserted into the clip's metadata to flag it as being special in some way. Now, the intended purpose is to make it easier to sort and organize clips that have the same type of flag. You can filter clips when you're using the camera's playback mode or possibly later in post if you use the right software. There are three types of clip flags, OK, No Good, and Keep. However, only an OK flag can be used with the clip flag button. If you want to be able to mark clips with No Good or Keep flags, then you'll need to give either of those two functions to one of the nine assigned buttons. Now, clip flags may sound good on paper, but in practice, you may find that clip flags aren't very helpful, and that's why I predict most people will seldom if ever use them. First, if you're going to use clip flags, then you must be very diligent about it, because if you accidentally forget to add the correct flag to any clips that should have been flagged, or if you add the wrong flag to a clip, then your whole workflow might be disrupted, and the consequences could be devastating. For example, it's not hard to imagine a scenario where clip flag mistakes could lead to good clips being ignored in post, or even worse, for good clips to be unintentionally deleted. And second, the actual usefulness of clip flags in post will vary depending upon the particular NLE that you use. At the time I'm producing this video, clip flags are not compatible with Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro, or DaVinci Resolve, which clearly account for the largest market share of professional video editing. On the bright side though, clip flags are compatible with Catalyst Browse, Catalyst Prepare, Vegas, Edius, and Avid Media Composer if the video files are imported with XML data. I highly recommend that you do some experimenting of your own to determine the real world practicality of clip flags in your own workflow before investing too much time into adding them to your clips. Now getting back to our tour around the camera, we find the focus switch on the front panel. Slide it down to focus the lens manually, or slide it up to turn on autofocus. That is, if your lens offers autofocus, and that the autofocus switch on the lens, if it has one, is also turned on. 
The FX6, like its bigger brother, the FX9, and its smaller brother, the Z90, has the most amazing fast hybrid autofocus system with over 600 phase detection points that cover about 90% of the frame. According to Sony, autofocus on the FX6 is about 400% faster than the FS5 and far more accurate. With the right combination of settings, the camera will rarely hunt for focus and is particularly good at tracking people. In many cases, the FX6 with its highly sophisticated face and eye detection tracking modes can focus better than I am able to do manually. You even have the ability to designate a particularly important face and then the camera will prioritize that person whenever it detects it in a crowd or group. And if you'd rather use the touchscreen for focusing, all you have to do is tap the screen where you want the camera to focus. Now, a handy way of activating autofocus temporarily when the focus switch is in the manual position is to press and hold the push autofocus button. When you release the button, autofocusing turns off again and the lens returns to manual focus. And surprisingly, the opposite is possible too. When the focus switch is in the auto position, you can press the push auto button to temporarily disable autofocus. And when you release the button, autofocusing resumes. As you can imagine, there's a lot more to autofocus than just a simple on or off switch. There are dozens of menus and hundreds of possible combinations of settings that allow you to customize autofocus to meet your individual preferences and to provide improved performance during different types of shooting situations. Therefore, we'll wait to explore autofocus in more detail during chapter 14. Now, let's move along to this group of controls that are used to adjust the electronic variable neutral density filter. The filter allows you to adjust the exposure seamlessly with no unwanted side effects. Want the exposure a little darker or lighter? Then just turn the dial. The ND filtering is applied smoothly without visible steps and no detrimental effects to the picture quality or color. I think this is one of the best features of the FX6, and once you've gotten used to using an electronic variable ND filter, it will be very hard to go back to any other camera that doesn't have it. And I stress the word electronic because I don't want you to confuse Sony's variable ND filter with the outdated and crude method of using two opposing polarizer filters in front of the lens to darken the picture. So imagine the freedom of being able to set your aperture, gain, and shutter speed exactly how you want them, and then just dial the ND filter up or down to account for different levels of light. This is a game-changing feature that can't be found on any non-Sony camcorder. Now, there are several different ND modes to choose from, and it's more complicated than just flipping a switch to turn it on. So we'll wait until chapters 12 and 13 to talk about the various ND filter options in more detail. Next, we find the multifunction dial, which, as the name says, has several different functions. First, during normal shooting, you can press in on the front of the dial at any time to enter the direct menu mode. This is the exact same direct menu mode we talked about previously. So this just gives you yet another method of quickly making changes to about 18 different camera settings. Second, whenever a menu is being displayed, you can turn the dial to move the cursor up or down to highlight a menu, and then press in on the dial to make your selection. When a menu is not being displayed, the multifunction dial can also be used as another assignable dial, much like the one we looked at on the grip. On my camera, I've programmed this dial to control the iris because many modern lenses, including the 24 to 105 kit lens, don't have an aperture ring. The multifunction dial is the next best thing. The iris button over here offers similar functionality. If I press the button once, the f-stop becomes highlighted in a white box. And then I can use the multifunction dial or one of the multi-selector joysticks to change the iris and then press the button again to lock in the new setting. But that's not all. If I press and hold the iris button for a moment, I can turn on all iris, and then press the iris button again to lock it in. Anytime you see the little A icon next to any setting in the monitor, that means it's operating in the automatic mode. To go back to the manual iris mode, I just press and hold the button again, choose manual, and then press the iris button twice to lock it in. Obviously, the usefulness of the iris button depends on whether or not you're using a lens that offers electronic iris control. As I said, we're going to wait until chapter 13 to get into the details of exactly how auto iris works and how it can be modified. But in the meantime, just know that there is almost no reason to ever use auto iris on the FX6 anyway. 
For those times when you do want to use auto exposure, and there are some situations where I think it does make sense, you'll want to use the auto ND filter mode instead. Once you see how great auto ND works, I'm sure you'll agree with me that auto iris is an outdated shooting mode that should rarely, if ever, be used on the FX6. Just below the iris button, we find the camera's menu button, which works a little differently than the menu button on other Sony camcorders. If you press the menu button momentarily, you won't turn on the menu system. Instead, the camera's status screens will be displayed, which makes it easy to view several pages of information about the camera's current settings without having to drill down to look at each individual menu. They are a huge time saver and something that you should get in the habit of using often. The status screens have been an important part of Sony's camcorders for many years, but on other cameras, they always have their own dedicated button to turn them on, but on the FX6, that duty is handled by the menu button. We'll come back to the status screens in a minute, but first, let's look at how to display the camera's regular menu pages. To do that, you have to press and hold the menu button down for a couple of beats, and then the menu pages will be shown. To be honest, I don't really care for the way this new system works because of the delay it causes every time I want to change a menu. I'd like it better if the function of the button could be reversed. Press the menu button momentarily to turn on the menus and press and hold the button to display the status screens. Unfortunately, that change is not possible, at least not with this version of the firmware. I'll explain the camera's menu system in chapter three. So for now, let's go back to the status pages because there's another big change from how previous Sony cameras work. On the FX6, you can actually make changes to many of the settings right from the status pages. With other Sony cameras, you can only look at the settings. You can't change anything. And I think this is an excellent improvement that greatly increases the usefulness of the status pages. Not all items can be modified from the status screens though. Only those settings that have a gray box around them can be changed. For example, on this page, the frequency can be changed, but the slow and quick motion frame rate cannot be changed. To change a setting, you first press in on the multi-function dial or one of the multi-selector joysticks, highlight the function you want to change, select it, choose a new setting, and then confirm your decision to lock it in. You'll notice that when we change the codec, the two media remain displays automatically updated themselves to reflect the new setting. Now, if you'd prefer, you can also select items directly from the touchscreen. But during this masterclass, I will continue to use the multi-function dials and the multi-selector joysticks because they make it easier for you to follow along with what I'm doing. You can decide for yourself which method you prefer to use. Now, most Sony cameras typically only have five or six pages of information, but the FX6 has 10. You've got main, camera, audio, project, monitoring, assignable button, battery, media, network, file transfer, and then it loops back around to main again. Unless you've shot with an FX9, this is probably the first time you've seen a status page called main. And I have to say, I really like the addition of this extra page because it pulls together information from all the other status pages and provides a snapshot view of 15 of the most important camera settings all in one place. For example, white balance is also shown on the camera status page. Video format is also shown on the project page, and the remaining capacity of the memory cards is also shown on the media page. Now, having all this information in one page is a big time saver and really helps reduce the chances of shooting with settings that you didn't intend. The second status page is called camera, and you can view information about the current settings of the white balance switch, the gain switch, the ND filter, the two zebra settings, and even the name of the current scene file. Status page three shows all of the most important audio related settings, including audio level meters that are several times larger than the default audio meters that are normally shown at the bottom corner of the LCD screen. Whenever you're setting critical audio levels, these are the meters you should be looking at. Next, the project page provides a snapshot of the most important settings related to the recording format, clip naming, the scan mode of the imager, raw output, and proxy recording. We'll talk more about all of those functions in later chapters. As the name suggests, the monitoring status page shows the output settings for SDI, HDMI, live streaming, and the viewfinder, actually the LCD monitor if you want to get technical about it. If info display is turned on, then the menus and other monitor data will be superimposed over the video stream. If it is off, then the output will be clean. 
As I mentioned previously, the FX6 has nine assigned buttons that allow you to customize the camera to suit your own needs. On this page, you can see what settings have been programmed for each of those buttons. Plus, the customizable focus hold button on the lens, if it has one, the multifunction dial, the dial on the grip, and the dial on the handle. We'll talk about all those controls in more detail during Chapter 11. The seventh status page provides detailed information about the attached battery, including when the battery was manufactured, the remaining capacity, and how many times it has been charged. If you happen to have a Sony LED video light mounted on the handle, then you'll also see some pass-through information about its battery as well. Page 8 shows the status of memory cards A and B. Page 9 displays the camera's network connection status, but the camera's networking capabilities are not covered in this masterclass. Why? Because most of those settings are too complex to set up, and I seriously doubt that even 2% of camera owners will ever use them. If you don't have an IT person in your organization to help you, or you're not knowledgeable yourself about setting up networks, configuring DNS settings, creating hosts, and choosing the correct port settings, not to mention having the right servers, routers, and other hardware, you're going to find it difficult to set up. And even then, there will still be many limitations that you'll have to deal with. Now, I don't mean to imply that the wireless networking capabilities aren't very robust and great features to have for the right people. I'm just saying that you are unlikely to be one of those people, so I'm not going to spend time covering it. After all, streaming and FTP transfer have very little to do with the operation of the camera itself, which is the focus of this masterclass. And finally, page 10 shows the status of any file transfers that the camera may be processing. Those files could be proxy files, full resolution files, or nothing at all, depending on how you've configured the camera. This topic is also not covered in this masterclass. Pressing the menu button again clears the status display completely from the screen and returns the camera back to the normal shooting mode. Now just to the left of the menu button, which should really also be labeled the status button, we find the thumbnail button and then the cancel back button. The cancel back button allows you to undo menu changes before you lock them in or to jump back one level in the menu hierarchy. I can't really explain why the thumbnail button is sandwiched in between the menu button and the cancel button. Anytime you want to play back clips that are stored on the memory cards, all you've got to do is press the thumbnail button and the playback mode will be ready to go almost instantly. You can navigate through the clips to view metadata about each one or select a clip to begin playback. We'll talk about the playback mode including the special thumbnail menus in chapter 26. A cool feature of the FX6 that I really like is that if something suddenly happens while you're playing back a clip and you want to start shooting it again right away, you can just hit the record button and the camera will exit the playback mode automatically and start recording in about one second. Just around the corner, over here, we find assigned buttons 1, 2, and 3. The default function of button number 1, as the label above it says, is to activate slow and quick motion. In case you don't know already, S and Q motion is Sony's terminology for overcranking and undercranking the frame rate. The camera can record 4K from one frame per second up to 120 frames per second internally, and it looks fantastic. But there are some limitations, gotchas, and caveats that need to be discussed, so we'll wait to talk about S and Q motion in chapter 22. Buttons number two and number three don't have any labels above them, but nevertheless, they each come pre-programmed from the factory with a default function. Button number two is programmed to quickly change the sensitivity and speed of the autofocus system. And button number three can be used to set the area of the picture where the camera will focus. We'll talk more about both of those autofocus settings in chapter 14. At the bottom of this group, we find the display button, which allows you to quickly clear the LCD monitor of almost all the on-screen clutter, and then bring it back again. I consider this my camera's dashboard display because it allows me to keep tabs on dozens of important settings while I'm shooting. However, if this is more information than you care to see, I'll show you in chapter four how almost all of this information can be customized and or hidden on an individual basis, which is a very powerful capability that many other cameras do not allow. Down in this area, we find several controls for white balance and exposure. First, we have the ISO gain button that should not be confused with the ISO gain toggle switch just below it. Now, the purpose of the ISO gain button is twofold. First, 
If you press the button once, you can change the sensitivity of the camera by adjusting the gain in 1 dB increments, and then pressing the button again to lock it in. On the other hand, if you press and hold the button for a couple of beats, then you can switch back and forth between the manual mode and the auto gain control mode. There's no indicator light on the button itself, so the only way you can be sure what gain mode you're using at any given time is by looking at the monitor. As I mentioned earlier, when you see a little A icon next to any setting, that means it's running on automatic. To go back to the manual mode, I'll press and hold the button again, choose 0 dB, and then press the button twice to exit. Whenever ISO or gain is set for manual control, the ISO gain toggle switch allows you to change how much gain is being applied at the flip of a switch. The default values are 0 dB for L, plus 6 dB for M, and plus 12 dB for H. But each of those settings can be reprogrammed if you'd prefer to use different presets. The allowed values range from minus 3 dB up to a whopping plus 30 dB. We'll talk more about gain and ISO in Chapter 12. Now, just as this pair of buttons controls the camera sensitivity to light, this pair of buttons controls the white balance. You can either press the button once to dial in a new setting or press and hold the button to choose a different mode. If anything other than automatic has been chosen, then the camera's white balance will primarily be determined by the position of the white balance toggle switch. You have the choice of using preset, memory A, or memory B. Another white balance related control can be found just around the corner on the front of the camera. This is the white balance set button that you use for executing a manual white balance when the toggle switch is set for either memory A or memory B. The white balance on the FX6 is a very complicated subject. We'll come back to these controls in chapter 15 when we'll have more time to get down into the details and explore how the settings interact and more importantly, how to get the best results. Next, we have the shutter button, and it should be obvious by now how it works. You can either press the button once to dial in a new setting, or press and hold the button to choose a different mode. We'll talk about all the available modes in Chapter 12. You can adjust the shutter speed in steps that range from 1 8,000th of a second up to 64 frames slow shutter. If you're not familiar with Sony's amazing slow shutter mode, stay tuned for Chapter 12 because it's a pretty cool feature that is absolutely essential to use when you're shooting time-lapse shots. Next, we find the camera's headphone jack. If you don't have any headphones connected during playback, then the audio will be output from the tiny little speaker right here. Unfortunately, there's no external knob for controlling the headphone volume. But as you'll see, there are a number of shortcuts available so you don't necessarily have to dive into the menus to adjust it. Now in this area, we find some of the camera's controls for audio channels 1 and 2. Now even though the FX6 always records at least four channels of audio, channels 3 and 4 don't normally have any external volume controls. But in chapter 25, I'll show you how you can add external control if you want to. This pair of audio select switches allows you to decide whether the audio recording levels of channels 1 and 2 will be controlled automatically or manually. If you choose manual, then the recording levels can be adjusted with the rotary audio recording level knobs located right next to them. There's a whole chapter devoted to audio a little later in this masterclass, and I don't want to waste your time explaining things twice. So once again, let's move along, which brings us to the slot select button. The slot select button allows you to designate which of the two memory cards is being used at any given time. Unless, of course, you're using the camera's simultaneous recording mode to record onto both cards at once. The camera's two memory card slots, known as A and B, are hidden behind this door. It's good to know that with most of the recording modes, if one card fills up during recording, the camera will automatically switch to the other card without missing the single frame. Both slots are able to accept either SD cards or a new type of card called CF Express Type A. Although most of the available codecs and frame rates can be recorded onto either type of card, you'll probably want to use CF Express cards to take advantage of the camera's impressive ability to record 4K at 120 frames per second. I say probably because there are some circumstances where fast SDXC cards will work just fine for all the S and Q motion frame rates. We'll talk more about recommended types of cards, formatting, simultaneous recording, and a very important difference between the two card slots to be aware of when we get to Chapter 6. Finally, we come to the power switch, which I hope is self-explanatory. 
slide it to the left to power the camera on, or slide it to the right to turn the camera off. Moving to the back of the camera, we find the rear tally light, which can be disabled using one of the menus if you don't want it to light up during recording. Unlike many other cameras, the FX6 gives you independent control over the front and rear tally light, so you can choose to have one without the other. Personally, I like to keep the front tally light turned off so people can't see when I'm rolling. Next, we have the battery slot and the battery release button. The FX6 uses BPU style batteries and it comes with one BPU35 that will power the camera for about two hours under normal operation. BPU batteries have been around for more than a decade and they're the exact same type of batteries that are used on the FX9, FS7, FS5, and Z280. So there are quite a few different sizes and models available from Sony and many third-party manufacturers to choose from. Too many, in fact, to even begin to talk about here. But BPU batteries aren't your only option. I have rigged up my FX6 to run an industry standard Anton Bauer V-mount batteries. The Anton Bauer Micro FX6 battery bracket is specially designed just for the FX6 and it attaches directly to the back of the camera without any rods or arms. Built for a machined aluminum, it utilizes a special V-mount plate which converts the battery voltage to the 19.5 volts that the camera requires. There's also a gold mount version of the bracket as well if that would fit your battery needs better. For added convenience, the position of the Micro FX6 can be easily adjusted to allow access to the camera's battery compartment and all the other controls at the rear of the camera. So what benefits does the Micro FX6 give me? Well, first of all, most of my other cameras, all of my field monitors, all of my external recorders, and all of my light panels LED lights are configured to run on Anton Bauer V-mount batteries. So setting up the FX6 to run on the same batteries was a no-brainer for me. Life is so much simpler for me when all of my gear can run on the exact same batteries. Anton Bauer's tiny new micro batteries are particularly well suited for use with the FX6. They're about half the size and weight of traditional V-mount and gold-mount batteries, yet offer the same professional build quality and reliability. Like all of the latest Anton Bauer batteries, they even have a built-in D-tap, also known as a power tap, and a USB jack. Now the second benefit of using V-mount batteries is that I get amazing run times. Even with the smallest V-mount battery I own, which is this tiny Anton Bauer Micro 90, I can get about seven hours of continuous run time. That is far longer than the two hours I get with the Sony battery that came with the camera. Now if I need a really long run time, I can use one of my Anton Bauer Titan SL150 batteries, which will run the FX6 for about 13 hours. How do I know that? Because the LCD on the battery tells me exactly right down to the hours and minutes how long I've got left. Even the new Titan SL90 battery is equipped with a built-in gauge for extreme accuracy. In fact, that's one of the big selling points of the Anton Bauer batteries when I'm using them on my light panel's LED lights. No matter what level I dim the lights to, the LCD screen always tells me exactly how much time I have left at that intensity. And that's a real lifesaver when you can't risk having the battery go dead in the middle of a shot. A third benefit of the bracket is that if I also have a BPU battery installed on the camera, I can hot swap V-mount batteries without ever turning off the camera. When one V-mount battery is removed, the BPU seamlessly takes over, and as soon as the fresh V-mount is attached, the camera switches over to the new battery. The fourth benefit of the Micro FX6 is that it features two 12-volt D-taps for powering accessories, such as an external recorder or on-camera monitor, an LED light, such as the industry standard light panel's brick bicolor light, or as a Kudo viewfinder. The last reason is especially important to me, but I'll wait to talk about viewfinders later. And the fifth benefit of using a V-mount battery is that it adds some extra weight to the rear of the camera to help counterbalance heavy lenses. Not only for handheld shooting, but just as importantly when the camera is on a tripod and you've got a lot of weight hanging out front. Now, if you only shoot with lightweight Sony E-mount lenses, you probably won't even care about moving the center of gravity farther back. But once you start using some high-end lenses with metal bodies and larger pieces of glass, you'll appreciate how much more comfortable and steady the camera will be with some added mass at the rear. Balance plus mass equals stability. Down here, we find a USB-C connector that actually does double duty. First, you can attach a smartphone and then connect to the internet using the phone's tethered mode. Once connected, you might be able to live stream or transfer clips via FTP, but those functions are not covered in this masterclass. 
Second, you can connect the camera via USB to a computer and transfer clips from the internal memory cards to a hard drive. But in my opinion, that's a function that should be reserved for emergencies only. Why would you want to use a $6,000 camera as a card reader when you can get a dedicated card reader for just a few bucks? Moving to the other side of the battery slot, we find the DC in connector for powering the camera from an AC power source. And by the way, you cannot use the camera as a battery charger. Just above the DC input connector, there's a port that Sony calls the multifunction connector, which is basically a micro B type USB 2.0 connector. Unlike the USB-C connector over here that we saw earlier, this one can only be used to connect the FX6 to a computer in order to offload clips. It cannot be used to tether the camera to a phone. I suspect the connector may have additional uses as well, so stay tuned for future announcements from Sony. Next, we find a length jack for connecting the camera to a wide variety of remote controls from Sony and third-party developers. Now, if you've been paying attention during this tour around the camera, then you must realize that the camera actually has two link connectors. There's this one for use with a remote control, and then there's the one we talked about earlier that is used to connect the camera to the grip. Even though I don't shoot with any E-mount lenses that have servo zoom controls, I do use a Sony RM1BP remote control, sometimes with my FX6, because it gives me a very handy record button on the handle of the tripod, which is especially convenient when I'm shooting wildlife and sports, and I don't want to have to take one of my hands off the camera or tripod handle to start rolling. Next up, we come to the timecode connector, which can be used for timecode in or timecode out, depending on the position of the switch located just around the corner. This is a great feature to have on the camera because it allows you to jam sync the FX6 with other cameras on a multi-camera shoot. Having synchronous timecode numbers recorded on each camera on a multi-camera shoot is worth its weight in gold when it comes time for editing. Even the FS7 and FS5 didn't have a timecode connector. We'll talk more about timecode in chapter 21. Just above the timecode connector, we find the camera's only SDI port. It'd be great to have two ports instead of just one, but at least it's a 12G connector, so it's capable of outputting a full-blown 4K 60P signal to a compatible monitor or external recorder, a capability that not too many other cameras can match. In chapter 20, I'll show you how to configure the SDI connector for 12G 4K or 3G HD, depending on your needs. And just to go one step further, the SDI connector can also be configured to send a 16-bit RAW signal to a compatible external recorder. Technically, RAW recording isn't part of this masterclass because it requires a lot of expensive extra hardware, but we will talk a little bit more about it in Chapter 5. Next, we find a full-size HDMI connector that can be configured for either HD or 4K output. You might be aware that with the old FS5, there was a hardware limitation that meant you'd lose the viewfinder when you were recording internally while simultaneously outputting 4K via HDMI. But the FX6 doesn't suffer from that limitation. You can record with a 4K video format, monitor with the LCD, output video via HDMI, and output video via SDI all at the same time. Now, there are several possible combinations of video output that we'll talk about in Chapter 20. Moving to the top of the FX6, we come to the camera's handle, which is obviously designed to do much more than just providing a way to carry the camera around. It's loaded with a ton of functionality, some of which is duplicated elsewhere on the camera body itself, but some functions are only found on the handle. The entire handle can be easily removed without tools simply by loosening these two knobs and pulling it off. But be aware that if you decide to remove the handle, there will be a price to pay, especially where audio is concerned. There's an internal stereo microphone at the front of the handle, a multi-interface shoe here, and two XLR input connections on the side. These are the only audio inputs on the FX6, so if you remove the handle, you have lost them all. Well, technically, there's a little microphone over here on the side that becomes active automatically whenever the handle is removed, but it's only good enough for scratch audio that you'd never want to actually use in an edit. So for all intents and purposes, when you remove the handle, you have also removed all audio input from the camera. And while we're on the subject of removing the handle, I want to bring to your attention these electrical connectors that become exposed whenever the handle isn't attached. They need to be protected with the plastic cap that is stored underneath the handle when it's not being used. Now, let's go back to the multi-interface shoe, known as the MI shoe for short. This connector has always been one of my favorite features of the Sony cameras that have it. 
What makes the MI shoe so special is that it has recessed electrical contacts that can facilitate cable-free two-way communication between the camera and compatible accessories. Available accessories include a bicolor dimmable LED video light, a single channel wireless microphone receiver, a dual channel wireless microphone receiver, meaning that it can receive audio from two different transmitters simultaneously, and a dual channel XLR audio adapter that allows you to add two additional XLR jacks to the camera. So you'll have a total of four. And as a bonus, the K3M even gives you a second shotgun microphone mount. I'll talk more about Sony's excellent wireless microphone transmitters and receivers in Chapter 25. But what I really like about the system is its ability to pass audio to the camera and also get power from the camera without any wires, extra batteries, or cables. The receiver basically becomes part of the camera rather than a cumbersome attached accessory with a lot of unnecessary wires and cables hanging all over the place. As I mentioned earlier, there's a built-in stereo microphone at the front of the handle which is fine for shooting situations where capturing perfect audio isn't necessary. But for improved performance, I recommend attaching an external shotgun microphone using the shock mounted holder. Depending on your budget, there are quite a few microphones that will work great with the FX6. Two XLR jacks are provided on the side of the handle for connecting external microphones, audio mixers, or any other professional audio source. Each jack has a corresponding input selection switch to tell the camera what type of signal you're going to feed into the XLR jack. The choices are line level, mic level, or 48 volt phantom power. Next, we have another record button that is perfectly positioned for triggering recording with your thumb whenever you're holding the camera by the handle during handheld shooting. Unlike other Sony cameras that have a simple record lock switch next to the record button, the FX6 has a hold switch that allows you to disable just about all of the controls on the handle so they can't be accidentally changed. Here we find another programmable assigned dial with six different possible functions. We'll talk more about all the available choices in Chapter 11. Over here, you'll find another zoom rocker switch that provides yet another way to change the focal length of a zoom lens. With the factory default mode, the zoom speed of the switch is variable, meaning the harder you press the switch, the faster the focal length changes. Unlike other Sony cameras, there's no switch on the handle to adjust the speed or sensitivity of the rocker switch. But there are some menu settings that can be changed to customize the switch's performance. We'll talk about those in Chapter 24. But even if you're not using a lens that has servo zoom control, you can still use the zoom lever with the camera's clear image zoom function. Next. We have two more assign buttons. The default function for number seven is for focus magnification and direct menu for number eight. Just below those buttons is what Sony calls the eight-way multi-selector D-pad, which is essentially the same thing as the multi-selector joystick we already saw on the grip. Next, we find three standard quarter 20 threaded sockets that are perfect for mounting all kinds of accessories. In fact, if you include the sockets that have rosettes for mounting the LCD panel, the camera and handle combined actually have a total of 11 quarter 20 mounting points. Underneath the camera, we find both quarter inch and 3 8 inch threaded sockets for rock solid attachment to a tripod quick release plate, thus reducing the twisting and rotating problems you can get with cameras that only use one screw. Now, my favorite tripod system used with the FX6 is the new Sackler Activate Head with Flotex 75 legs. If you think that all tripods and heads are basically the same and that technology hasn't changed in decades, you need to take a closer look at the latest products from Sackler. First of all, the Flotex 75 carbon fiber tripod, and there's a bigger 100 millimeter version too if you prefer, can be deployed in a matter of seconds thanks to its patented quick release mechanism. Notice that there are no locks on the legs themselves. Everything is done with the unique quick release levers near the base of the head. No more bending over to lock or unlock legs one at a time. Until you try it for yourself, it's hard to appreciate what a difference that makes. And due to their carbon fiber construction, I found that the Flotec tripods are much stronger, more rigid, and lighter than any comparable tripods in their class. Of course, a tripod is only as good as the head that you put on it. And I found that Sackler's new Activate Fluid Head is the perfect match for the FX6 and the Flotec legs. The pan and tilt performance is extremely smooth and makes it effortless to execute perfect camera moves with nicely ramped beginning and endings every time. 
There are seven stages of adjustment on the pan axis, seven stages on the tilt axis, and 15 counterbalance settings to choose from, which is an often overlooked but very important feature of a head. Here's the test I do to see if a head is any good or not. I must be able to smoothly pan and tilt by applying light pressure with just one finger. And when I release my finger, the head cannot snap back or sag or drift even a fraction of an inch. If a head can't do that, what good is it? Now, Sackler's new speed level technology on the Activate head is a revolutionary new way of leveling the head faster and easier than ever before. You simply pull up on this lever, level the head, then push the lever back down. It's that simple. When you combine that feature with the levers on the tripod, there really is no tripod system in the world that is faster and easier to deploy. Another key feature that shouldn't be overlooked is that when you combine the Activate head with the Flowtech legs, you can get super low angle shots because there's no adjustment knob underneath the head anymore. You can literally put the Flowtech 75 directly on the ground, thus eliminating the need for baby legs or hi-hats. In case you'd like to know more about how to set up and use this tripod system, I put some links down below for a couple of Sackler instructional videos that go into more detail than I have time for. Before we wrap up this chapter, I promised to circle back around and talk about viewfinder options. So let's do that now. Now, as I already said, I can't shoot with a camera that doesn't have a good viewfinder. And the FX6 doesn't come with any viewfinder at all. So I made it a high priority to do something about that as soon as my camera arrived from B&H. I reached out to Zakudo and they kindly agreed to let me test drive three potential viewfinder solutions. A beta version of their new Z Finder that has been specially designed to fit the FX6 a Gradical Eye, and a Chameleon Pro. After using them all for weeks now, I can honestly say that I'd be perfectly happy to have any of the three mounted to my FX6 as a permanent viewfinder solution. But with that said, they each have their own unique pros and cons. In the next few minutes, I'd like to share my thoughts about each one, and maybe that will help guide you to a viewfinder solution that will fit your needs best. Let's start with the Z-Finder because I suspect it will be a very popular accessory for hundreds, if not thousands of FX6 owners. The Z-Finder is essentially a magnifying viewfinder or loop that fits over the FX6's existing LCD screen to make the image bigger and easier to see, while also blocking out ambient light and reflections. Z-Finders for other cameras have been around for years and they have a great reputation, but this model has been specifically designed to fit perfectly over the FX6's existing LCD monitor. So the image quality of the Z-Finder looks pretty good because you're still using the camera's regular LCD monitor and the optical quality of the Z-Finder's diopter complements it perfectly. Now the mounting system is simple, secure, and rock solid. I'll admit that before it arrived, I was skeptical that the camera's very weak LCD mounting system would be strong enough to support the extra weight of the Z-Finder. But those doubts were raised as soon as I saw Zakudo's innovative way of attaching its frame to the LCD panel. Trust me when I say it's rock solid and plenty sturdy enough to press your eye socket firmly against during handheld shooting. The diopter itself is easy to adjust to anyone's eyesight, and the loop can be released and flipped up out of the way anytime you prefer to look at the LCD directly. I mean, a loop is great most of the time, but even I sometimes prefer to look at a small monitor when I'm working from a dolly or shooting a stationary sit-down interview or something like that. It's great that the loop stays attached so you don't have to find someplace safe to set it down. The advantages of the Z Finder are it requires no extra batteries, no extra power cables, it doesn't use your SDI or HDMI connectors, and you get to keep the three buttons along the side of the monitor, peaking, zebra, and assign button number nine. So the Z-Finder might be the perfect solution for you to add a proper viewfinder to your camera. But I will point out that you are limited by the image quality of Sony's LCD monitor, which is good, but not great. If you really want to take a serious step up in image quality, let me introduce you to Zakudo's Gradical Eye OLED viewfinder. In a word, it is gorgeous. The image quality is stellar and it's built like a tank. It's a serious viewfinder for serious work. And I have to say that it's something you really need to see for yourself to fully appreciate. Now the Gradical Eye is the smallest and lightest of Zakudo's micro OLED viewfinders and weighs only 14 ounces. Here you see it attached to my camera with a Zakudo arm that provides virtually unlimited positioning options. And although it's not possible for me to show the menus to you here, there are literally hundreds of customization options to fine tune the Gradical Eye to perform exactly how you want it to function. 
You've got peaking, zebras, LUTs, markers, focus mag, histograms, waveforms, customizable function buttons, and much more. The zebra and peaking functions alone are far superior to what you get with the FX6's LCD panel. I describe them as being more delicate, precise, and refined, kind of like silk versus burlap. In my opinion, better peaking and zebra are reason enough to justify the higher cost of upgrading from a snap-on Z Finder loop to a full-blown electronic viewfinder. Now, if you're an experienced shooter who is used to having top-notch viewfinders on your camera, you won't be disappointed with the Gradical Eye. You can even configure the viewfinder and camera so that the camera feeds a tally light signal to the viewfinder to let you know when it's recording. Now that is a great feature to have for those times when you want to press the display button on the camera to hide all the rest of the on-screen clutter, but still have a tally light. But there are some downsides to the Gradical Eye that need to be considered. First, like any electronic viewfinder, the Gradical requires power. It has a two-pin LIMO connector that is easy to adapt to D-TAP, and that is where the Anton Bauer Micro FX6 bracket with its two D-TAPs plus one on the battery itself comes in handy. I can power the camera and viewfinder from the same battery for hours and hours at a time. The D-TAP power cable for the Gradical even has a handy built-in power switch. Yes, there are some third-party BPU batteries that also offer D-TAPs, and I think Zacuto even has some models of EVFs that can be self-powered with a detachable battery, but I prefer to use V-mount batteries for all the reasons I talked about earlier in this chapter. A second thing to be aware of is that the Gradical Eye only has an SDI input, and the camera only has one SDI output, so essentially you have to give up the SDI output on the camera to feed the viewfinder. Now that might be an issue for you or it might not, depending on what other accessories or monitors you use with the camera. The good news is that there's absolutely no reason that you can't have the Gradical and the FX6's regular LCD monitor mounted at the same time, so you have the best of both worlds, especially if you want to use the touchscreen features of the LCD monitor. Now, if you'd prefer to use the camera's HDMI port to feed an accessory viewfinder so you can keep the SDI port free for other things, then I would suggest you consider the Zacuto Chameleon Pro. The Chameleon is similar in size to the Gradical Eye, but differs in some software features and it has both SDI and HDMI inputs. Compared to the Gradical, the Chameleon offers a higher resolution OLED display, 4K HDMI input downscaled to 1080p, and 3D LUTs. Other than that, I'd have to say the features and performance of the two EVFs are quite similar, thus making it hard to recommend one over the other. If you have the chance to compare them head to head before choosing, I recommend that you do so. So after test driving all three viewfinder options, which one have I chosen to use with my FX6? Well, if I was on a budget and didn't need the higher performance and advanced features of the two electronic viewfinders, I'm sure I could be quite happy with the Z Finder. It makes a great addition to the camera and it is well worth the price. It gets my full endorsement. But I'm very picky about the equipment I choose to use. Video and television production is my career, my livelihood, and my passion. I'm accustomed to using viewfinders on my other cameras that are far superior to the LCD panel of the FX6. So I've decided to go with the Gradical Eye. Now, technically, the Chameleon has superior specifications and offers both HDMI and SDI inputs, but I prefer the features of the Gradical. The image quality is almost as good as the Chameleon, and I prefer the performance of the Peking Zebras on the Gradical. Yeah, it hurts a little to give up the SDI connector, but I'll adapt. And now I've got a great viewfinder that will serve me for many years on the FX6 and also on future cameras when the FX6 has become just a distant memory. So that concludes our quick overview of the camera, and you should now have a pretty good understanding of the major features of the FX6, plus a general sense of where the important buttons and controls are located. But what I haven't done yet is give you very much detail, and that's what's coming up in the next 25 chapters.